the book of First Timothy. This is message number 18, and we're in First Timothy chapter 3, so you want to turn your Bible there. First Timothy chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse 10, or verse 8, verse 8. So, here we go. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith of the pure conscience, but let these also first be proved then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus." These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ." nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed, but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself rather to godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Verse 11. These things command and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Lord, we thank you for your word, that your word always works. And Lord, your word says, if any man speak, let him speak the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it with the ability that God gives that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray you will bless our time together in your word, that you will bless our fellowship together. You already have. I've already been blessed by everyone here that I've gotten to talk with or share with and hear about them and listening to the Christmas practice, Lord. 
I have been blessed, and I'm so grateful. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask for your blessings upon this place and that you will use us to bring people to you and make disciples, Lord Jesus. We love you. And all of God's people said, amen. So loving the living God, message 18, loving the living God. And so number one, in chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, we've been talking about deacons and how a good, godly, qualified deacon is advantageous to the eldership. And I'm very grateful for our deacons and our fellowship because they certainly are. What a blessing they've been to all of us. So we pick up with the deacon's reputation, verse 8. Likewise, deacons, which means servant, right? Servant must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Verse 10, but let these also first be tested. So they have to be proved, proven. Let them, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. So they're tested for whether or not they are blameless in the community. They must have a good report in the community. And that takes time to find out. So give that time, Paul says. Let them first be tested and proved. So our reputation matters. Likewise, so they have to have a good report in the community. Reputation matters. And then... Verse 11, likewise, their wives must be reverent. So what else about a deacon? Well, their wives must also be qualified in order for their husbands to serve as a deacon. You don't just look at the husband. You also look at the wife's life. So likewise, the wives must be reverent, reverent, respectful, not slanderers, right? Not a slanderer, a false accuser, or malicious gop- gossips. Women who spout out evil, right? Or re- who repeat unverified character assassinating stories. Maybe you've had people gossip about you. And it is certainly hurtful when people lie about you to other people for whatever purpose they have. I have experienced that where people have lied about me and it's not true. And what do you do about it? You have to trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. So God says these ladies need to be reverent, filled with worthy respect that They draw respect from those around them because of their love for the Lord. That's so important. So important. They're not slanderers. They're not busybodies. They're not gossips. And we know that gossip is pure evil. Not slanderers. Temperate. Self-control. Their wives have self-control. Right? They're not known for gossips. They're not known for being busybodies. They're not known for the ones you can go to to get information about others, right? They're temperate, meaning they have self control. They know how to control themselves through the power of the Holy Spirit. They're faithful in all things. So they're faithful, serving the Lord Jesus in every area of their lives, right? Not just at church or at the women's tea, you know what I mean? It's not just at church and when they're with church people or God's people, but they're faithful in every area of their life. They're serving Christ in every area of their life, in their private life and in their public life. And so that applies to all of us, doesn't it? Our private lives matter to the Lord. Our public life matters to the Lord, right? We don't just put on good behavior or they would say put on airs when we're around others and then when we're by ourselves in our private life, we're totally different. Or we say things we would never say 
if everybody in the fellowship was standing there listening to us, right? So they're faithful in all things in their life. Now, it's not talking about perfection. It's talking about their character, right? This is their godly character. So wives have to be worthy of respect, not slanders or false accusers or gossips. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 31, verse 10, Proverbs 31, verse 10, who can find a virtuous wife? A virtuous wife. A wife who is filled with virtue. Who can find? For her worth is far above rubies. Rubies are those precious gems, right? Worth lots and lots of money. God says, a virtuous wife, a godly woman, is worth far more, far above the price of rubies, plural, right? And that is a blessing. I'm grateful that I have a virtuous wife. And it is my heart's desire to raise virtuous daughters, that's for sure. Proverbs 31.30 says this, Charm is deceitful, right? Charm, they're so charming, they're so sweet. Oh boy, right? Don't be deceived by sweetness and a smile, that's for sure. Charm is deceitful. And beauty is passing, or it's vain. As you've heard, beauty is truly only skin deep. But in contrast to charm and beauty, if that's all a woman is about, God says, that is not a godly woman. If that's the limit of her reputation, she's so charming and she's so beautiful, right? God says, you don't want to marry a woman if that's all she's got, right? And ladies, you don't want to be that kind of lady that that's the focus of your life. That's what the world tells you. But God says your character, your godliness is key. But a woman who fears the Lord, right? A woman who fears the Lord, the Bible says, she, it's very specific, she, and only her, the Bible says, shall be praised. Praised. That's what you want, to fear the Lord. That's the key. To fear God. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, 4, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. Proverbs 19, 14, houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife is a woman who actually reads the Bible, has a relationship with Jesus, right, by faith, and by the grace and power of the Spirit, she has a desire to obey the Word of God. A prudent woman. She wants to honor the Lord in her life, her public life and her private life. That matters. Verse 12. So reputation matters. Reputation matters. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife. So a deacon is not to have an eye for other ladies, right? A flirt. He's not to be engaged in seeking female companionship outside of his marriage. Only his wife. Only his wife. He's to be the husband of one wife. He's not to have more than one wife. Ruling, it says, managing. Ruling means to manage. Managing their children. So his wife's and his children, right? Or he and his wife's children. Ruling, that means to manage. Ruling means to manage their children. Managing the children and their own houses well, right? He's not called to manage and meddle in other people's homes, but his own home is in order. His own home is in order. So I want to encourage not just our deacons, and, but all of us to remember something. I have found the book of Proverbs is the Father's best friend. 
you go through the book of Proverbs, there's one proverb for every day of the month. It's also the mother's best friend, but I'm not a mama, right? But I can guarantee you it will be a blessing to you. And going through the book of Proverbs once a month, it will give you guidance. Do you need guidance? You want to know what to do about situations? You want to be guided? In fact, I will challenge you. The proverb that you read that particular day, in my life at least, I have found to have all the answers that have faced me that day specifically. <laughs> without, without fail, without fail, I will read something in that chapter of Proverbs that has a direct application do something in my life that I'm dealing with and how grateful I am because now I'm like, oh, that's right. That's right, Lord. Thank you, right? I know what to do. Thank you, Lord. I remember. I want to encourage you from the book of Proverbs. Read the book of Proverbs once a month if you can and obey it. Obey the Proverbs that you read. Obey them through the power of the Holy Spirit which is through fellowship with Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. Spend more time with Jesus, right? Spend more time with Jesus. Let him change your heart. Verse 13, I love this. For those who have served well, so if you've served well as a deacon, there's a promise that you're advantageous to your elders, a blessing to the elders. Well, as deacons obtain, God gives them something. They obtain for themselves a good standing. Don't you love that? A good public standing like Stephen and Philip in the scripture in the book of Acts. They obtain for themselves a good public standing because their private lives are consistent with their public lives. That's for sure. And God honors them, right? If you honor the Lord in the prayer closet, what does God say? I will reward you openly in your public life, in your private life, right? Honoring the Lord in your prayer closet first. God takes care of the rest. So these deacons, Stephen and Philip's life are great examples for all of us. So the first blessing from God is a good public standing in the eyes of men. Not that you need that, but it is a respect that you are worthy of because your life is godly, right? It's not, you better give me respect. No, it's you've earned that respect because of how you've lived your life. That's awesome. When people respect you because of your reputation, because of who you are in Christ and how you live your life, that is awesome. Awesome. So being a man of integrity. In fact, the Bible says the righteous man walks in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. And then so the first thing, you obtain a good standing and then great boldness. That's the second blessing, great boldness. And that word boldness is free and bold speaking. That's what God gives to the man who is an advantageous servant to the elders of the church and the flock that he serves. That's awesome. What a blessing. Bold in speaking, freedom of speaking, speaking out every word. So it's a dominant idea is boldness, confidence, as opposed to fear, ambiguity, or reserve. And this boldness pertains to the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So that's what the scripture says. Boldness in the faith. The faith is that body of doctrine that we believe, right, in the scriptures that God has said, this is the truth. These are the doctrines I want you to believe. And God says, the deacon that serves well obtains from the Lord great boldness, freedom of speech, fearlessness in communicating the truth of God's word. I love that. I love that. No fear. That's from the Lord. That's a reward for their humble, obedient service. Number two, right believing. Verses 13, or 14 through 16, right believing. So we move from deacons, qualifications, and now we move into right believing, verses 14 to 16. These things, what things? 
These things is referring to what Paul has written in the book of First Timothy, the scriptures, the scriptures. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, right? I want to tell you in person. I'll reiterate what I've written to you, Timothy. I won't change anything because this is a, the truth of God's word. It's these things that you need to hear and know. But, verse 15, if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself. So I'm writing these scriptures so you know how to conduct, how to behave yourself, how to lead, how to serve, what to teach, what to teach, right? So that you know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, in the local body of Christ. So this is how every pastor is to conduct himself in the local bodies of which Christ has called them to serve. First Timothy is the answer to the pastor's dilemma, what should I do? <laughs> what you should do, read First Timothy. It's all there, what you need to be focused on, what you need to do. He told him, don't teach anything but the scriptures, right? He said, use the law lawfully. Use the law to bring people to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. He talked about having a good conscience because if you don't have a good conscience before the Lord, you can shipwreck your faith. You will shipwreck your faith, right? Then he goes in, first of all then, after all that, talking about his life and his commitment to Christ, Timothy, get the church praying. Make sure the people pray and meet for corporate prayer, and he goes through. And then he talks about men praying everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And then he talks about women and what they're to be focused on, homemakers, godly homemaking, right? And then he goes into the qualifications for elders and for deacons. So all these things you ought to know, so you know how you are to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. So the house of God, the local body of Christ, is a part of what? The universal body of Christ, which is the church of the living God. And Jesus is the one who said to the Sadducees, you're greatly mistaken. You don't know the power of God, and you don't know the scriptures. You know why? Because God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, right? But of the living. He is the living God. He is the one true and living God. And so the church, speaking of the church, Paul describes by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God says the church is the pillar. A pillar is, is, is a post, if you will, a glorified post upholding the truth. The truth, right? The church of God, the living God, has a responsibility in this world to be holding up the truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. The church is to hold up Christ as the way, the truth, and life, and God's word. The church is the place where God has designed for the world to learn his truth from his church. If the church fails to uphold the truth of the living God, then the church has failed its purpose that's for sure so the church is the pillar the post upholding the truth and ground the foundation of the truth in this world because Christ is the foundation of the church in our life so the church's responsibility is enormous we can never set aside the word of God because once the church the local church sets aside the word of God and follows what is culturally acceptable, we no longer uphold the truth of the living God. We're no longer operating as God designed the local church to operate. We're in disobedience to God. And if we read the book of Revelation, four out of seven churches were rebuked by the Lord Jesus. And he told the church to repent. Repent. And then he says, or else. Or else. So the church, the source of the truth is the living God. 
His church is designed to uphold his truth, his word in the world. So here's Paul talking about the qualifications of elders and deacons because the, they have to be the ones who recognize what the design of the church is. The pillar and ground of the truth. That is where people go to know the truth of God. The truth. So those qualifications are very important because those elders will certainly follow the word of God. The church that does not do this is definitely not a church. And then verse 16 and without controversy, the Bible says. That means uncontestable. It's without controversy, undeniable. Every elder, every deacon, and all the sheep need to follow these doctrines. And without controversy, it means undeniable. The following statement is undeniable, uncontestable, beyond question. And it is our confession. That word controversy also includes a confession. And there are several things, but first he says, great, great is the mystery. A mystery is something that was previously hidden. And in this case, it's the truth of God that was previously hidden, but it's been revealed by God and understood by the believer according to one lexicon. So truth that was hidden in the past has been revealed through Christ and the Holy Spirit and it's believed by the believer. Understood. So great is the mystery, the hidden truth now revealed in Christ, of godliness. It's a mystery of godliness. What makes a person godly? This is the mystery of godliness. What makes a person godly? Well, correct doctrine and obedience to the Spirit, but by faith in Christ is the first step, right? Faith in Christ and then living a godly life means you're walking in obedience to what you've been taught from God's Word. So there are six things. The mystery of godliness involves six truths. Six truths. Number one. Number one. God, God was manifested in the flesh. Who? Who was manifested in the flesh? God was manifested, manifested in the flesh. Now, excuse me. <laughs> he was revealed in the flesh. And how did that happen in John 1.1? 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, so God became a human being. That's, what, that's why we celebrate Christmas. God became a human being through the Virgin Mary. Number two, he was justified in the Spirit. Romans 1.4 says he's declared to be the Son of God with power by the Holy Spirit. He's declared to be God, God through his resurrection. He's justified in the Spirit, proven to be God, who He claimed to be in the flesh. Number three, number three, this is the mystery of godliness, these six doctrines, and we should all know them. Every single one of us should know these six doctrines by heart. So I challenge you, if you don't, that you do. Number three, seen by angels. They recognized him for who he was. The angels, in Hebrews 1, verse 6, God says, let all the angels of God. How many angels? Let all the angels of God, what? Worship him. And how many angels are there? Trillions of angels. Let all the angels of God worship him. So he was seen by angels, and they worshiped him. In number four, the mystery of godliness, number four, preached among the Gentiles, which is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Romans 15, 9 through 13 speaks of Gentiles coming to the one true God through Christ. 
And that is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy and the reason we're here now, proving that the Bible's true. Number five, believed on in the world, right? Believed on in the world. Revelation 7, 9 through 10, when you read that out of the tribulation, tribulation believers, it says, you can't even number them. That's how many there are. It's beyond the ability to number all the people who come out of the tribulation. We're not even mentioning the rapture of the church before the tribulation, right? We're just talking about believers coming out of the tribulation period, and it says you can't even number how many they are, right? And it says from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Isn't that awesome? That's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Believed on in the world, right? God being manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and number six, number six, received up into glory. Isn't that awesome? So where is Jesus? Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And in Acts chapter one, Jesus is communicating to his disciples and he ascends into heaven from the Mount of Olives, right? And what is he going to do? To sit at the right hand of God, fulfilling Psalm 110, verse 1. And what's happening right now? Even though it may not look like it, it may look like evil and wickedness have the upper hand, the Bible says that God is making Christ's enemies his footstool. That's what's happening. Everything's being set up for that. And so we do rejoice. So these are the, this is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, and he says it's without controversy. It's undeniable. That's what Paul, it's uncontestable, and it is to be our confession. Confess these six things openly and share them. Justified in the spirit. Proved to be God in the flesh through the resurrection of the dead, Right? Seen by angels, worshipped by the angels, trillions of them because of who he is. Preached among the Gentiles so that they could be saved, and it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Believed on in the world, fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Received up in the glory, fulfillment, and continual fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And Paul says, that's the mystery of godliness, Timothy. Teach those six doctrines over and over and over and over again, right? Make disciples who know these six doctrines, the mystery of godliness. Number three, recognize the dangers. Recognize the dangers. Chapter four, verse one. Recognize the dangers. Now, Timothy, now we're moving on, right? The Greek word here is in contrast to the true faith. So what he's doing now Paul has communicated, here is the true faith, these six doctrines that I just communicated to you. This is the mystery of godliness, these six truths that are without controversy and they are to be our confession. However, the next verse says in chapter 4, now, which is communicating a contrast like the word but, but, but. In contrast to the true faith, the Spirit, the Spirit expressly says, Timothy, you need to know this. The Spirit expressly says, he's wanting to get our attention. Yes, the mystery of godliness is true, but you need to know something. The Spirit wants you to know that in latter times, so... We know that the last days began in Acts chapter 2 with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And in the latter times of the last days, that's what he's communicating. Some will depart, depart from the faith. Yikes! In contrast to the mystery of godliness, they will not believe those six doctrines. Some will depart from the faith. They will depart. The word depart is the Greek word that has two forms, two root forms. The first root form is apo, which means from, from. Apo means from. 
And histomy means to stand to place. It means to stand away from. So in contrast to the mystery of godliness, right, which is if you believe the mystery of godliness, then you are a part of the kingdom of God, right? By believing those six truths. In contrast to them, though, people will stand away from those six truths. And they will attack those six truths. And why will they do that? Well, we'll read why. But the Spirit says expressly, it's in the body of Christ. It's in the church. Timothy, don't be surprised that you're going to have people in your church who will stand away from the mystery of godliness and they will still claim to be godly. They will still claim to be Christians. So why will they do this? Why will they stand away from the mystery of godliness, the faith that Paul just described for us, from the faith? Here's why. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and human beings because there will be teachers, there will be preachers, there will be evangelists who will contradict those six truths that Paul just shared with Timothy the mystery of godliness. What has, what you, these are fundamental truths that are non-negotiable, that are without controversy and without question and need to be in our repertoire of confessing, right? He says there will be people in the church claiming to be Christians, but really they have deceiving spirits inhabiting them. That's why they will stand away from and depart. And doctrines of demons. Can you imagine? They're going to hold the Bible and they're going to add to the scriptures, like the Mormon church. They're going to add to the scriptures. You go to the Mormon website and they have an article on hope, on hope. And in fact, when you type in, I forgot what I typed in, Jesus is our hope or the hope of the world, they're the top link is the Mormon church taking you to an article on what they believe hope is. And it is filled with error and it also has scripture. It has the Bible, has scriptures about Jesus, but it is loaded with demonic and false doctrine throughout it, sprinkled throughout it. It all sounds good, but if you know the scriptures, you know they're denying the mystery of godliness completely, completely denying it when God says you can't. You can't and be in the body of Christ. It's not going to happen. So the Mormon church proves time and time again that they are demonic. And so Paul says the spirit speaks expressly, pointing this out to you. Don't tolerate it in your church. Doctrines of demons. So we're talking about teachings that will originate from demons. <laughs> demons will come up with doctrine. Don't be surprised, right? When you're sitting there watching television and wondering how politicians and leaders and the masses can follow doctrines, that are so contradictory and ungodly to Scripture, and you have your answer. But Paul is specifically talking about the church, and the church is just as corrupt in America. There's no doubt about it. Elders are not upholding what God said they're supposed to be upholding as the leaders of the body of Christ, the truth of the living God. What a shame. And I pray that never happens here. So doctrines of demons. That means these teachings originate from demons. They're no longer following the word of God. They're not cutting the scriptures straight, as Paul told Timothy. Cut it straight. Teach it the way God said to teach it. Don't twist it. Don't add to it. 
don't take away from it, teach the word of the living God. That's what God needs elders and shepherds to be doing and the sheep to be learning. That's for sure. That's for sure. Verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy. So they're lying hypocrites, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So that is a brand, brand with a hot iron. So if you're branded with a hot iron, what does that do? If someone took an iron, stuck it on your arm, right? What does that do? It's going to brand you. What do you do to cattle? What do ranchers do? They brand the cattle, right? And it creates a scar. And when you have a scar on your flesh, that means you can't, right? There's no feeling. The, it's gone. The feeling's gone. And so Paul's describing these teachers in the body of Christ who are pretenders. They're really not believers. They're standing away from the mystery of godliness and contradicting it in the church. Claiming to be pastors, it's crazy, but that's what happens. That's what's happened in our nation. That's for sure. So they speak lies and hypocrisy. They're lying hypocrites. They say one thing and do another, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So their conscience has been seared so they can't feel it. They don't have a good conscience. They don't even know what a good conscience is. You think, how can you do that? How can you preach that Jesus is the brother of Satan. You must have a conscience that is seared with a hot iron, right? How can you stand away from the mystery of godliness that God was manifested in the flesh, justified by the power of the Spirit of God, seen by the angels, right? How can you stand away from the truth of God's word? Because your conscience has been seared that's how. And how does your conscience become seared? Slowly. You move away from the Word of God. You start listening to something else, something new, right? Something, oh, it's exciting, right? Oh, it's cool. Everybody's going. Everybody's listening. But are they upholding what God said for the elders to be upholding? The local body of Christ is supposed to be upholding what? The glorified post. The foundation that's built on Christ, we're supposed to be holding up the truth of God's word. Hey, the word of God, baby. This is the book you follow. We never put it down. We never compromise it. And you young people, the rest of your life, you want to go to a church that upholds the written word of God, that teaches the word of the living God. When you go to that church, they teach you the Bible. They teach you the Bible. And that is so important. So they speak lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And what are their demonic doctrines? What are these men teaching? Well, first of all, they're teaching that you can't get married. <laughs> you can't get married. That contradicts the scriptures. You can't get married. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all, the Bible says. Paul said to get married if you can't, if you don't have the, the gift to be single, right? He said, get married. God wants you to get married. If you don't have the gift to be single, marry a godly woman, marry a godly man. You're free to marry as long as it's a godly, born-again believer, right? You're free to marry in the Lord Jesus. So these lying hypocrites whose conscience is seared they attack marriage, the sanctity of marriage. They attack the family, <clears throat> excuse me. They attack God's institution of marriage. They forbid to marry. They forbid to marry. You can't get married and serve the Lord. That's what they teach. And commanding, the next thing that they teach that is a demonically inspired doctrine, commanding to abstain from foods. Oh, you can't eat pizza. It's just not holy. You know, if you're going to be serving God, you can't be eating pizza. You can't have bacon. If you're going to serve God, you better not be eating bacon. No pancakes with peanut butter. Now, hey, all things in moderation, yeah? All things in moderation. 
But food does not commend you to God, whether you eat or don't eat, right? Whether you eat that or don't eat that, that's not going to make you more righteous in God's eyes. It's not going to make you more spiritual. But these demonic teachers are communicating, hey, if you don't get married, it makes you more spiritual. It makes you more righteous in God's eyes. You'll have more spiritual power. You'll have more of an impact in the world. <laughs> They're teaching lies. Lies. And then they say that if you don't eat certain foods, oh man, you're, you're, you're going to be super spiritual now. You're going to be really empowered by God. So it's an asceticism, right? That I'm going to discipline my body so well that God's going to endow me with greater spiritual power. That's not true. That is flat out not true. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. Paul did write that if you are single, right, you can spend every waking moment serving the Lord, right? And if you're not single, you can spend every waking moment serving the Lord, but you're going to be spending time serving your wife and your family, right? And that's how God designed it to be. It's a good thing, not a bad thing, to where these men would be saying it's a bad thing. Well, that's a doctrine of demons. So commanding to abstain from foods which God created. <laughs> God created these foods, and you're saying, I can't eat them or I'm not spiritual, to be received with thanksgiving. So God created foods to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth, by those who believe the truth and who are experiencing the power of the truth. So the key here is God created foods to be received with thanksgiving, and they deny that. What a shame. For every creature of God is good. Have you read that in Genesis? How many creatures does it say? Genesis chapter 1, verse 21 and 25, it says, they are all good. Isn't that something? God said, every creature of God is good, and nothing, in the Greek, it says, not even one is to be refused, if, if it is received with thanksgiving. And what did Jesus do when he broke or blessed the fish and the loaves. He was always what? Giving thanks. He's always giving thanks. We follow his example. Giving thanks for our food to the Lord. Every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be received, refused. Why is that? Verse 5. For it is sanctified, it is set apart to God or by God as holy. Do you know that your food? In other words, your food, there is no such thing as holy food. Okay? Pizza, steak, mashed potatoes and gravy, salad, broccoli, beets, sauerkraut, right? There's no such thing as holy food according to the word of God. This is holy, this is not. No. He says here, your food is sanctified, set apart by God as holy. When? when? By the word of God. He already said it was good. And by prayer. Isn't that awesome? When you pray and thank the Lord for your food, God sanctifies your food as holy. Wow, that Sunday that you're going to eat tonight with chocolate chips and hot fudge, if I thank the Lord for it, He's going to set it apart as holy? Well, it does say the foods that He created, right? So, anyway, I'm not going to answer that question. I'll let you answer that question. Don't let anyone tell you this is holy food and this isn't, right? No food is holy of itself. However, when you receive foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving, they are sanctified, acquire, acquires a holy quality by the word of God and prayer. I love that. That just makes me want to make sure I pray every time I take a bite out of something, right? Thanking the Lord for it. 1 Corinthians 8, 8 says this, but food does not commend, applaud, or praise us to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. Food does not give you a spiritual edge. 
only faith in Christ and fellowship with Him and love in Him. Amen? I sure appreciate you all coming tonight. Thank you and God bless you.